first presentation on nutrition, more experimental evidence support for what I was talking about with bicarbonate management and its uh, primary uh, uh, importance in Florida. And that's our work uh, in, in, in combination with uh, colleagues in soil and water science. I'm also going to talk about two subjects uh, that I don't have any participation in, uh, either directly or indirectly, and that is the subjects of antimicrobials and thermotherapy. And I, again, uh, share uh, Luis's frustration because you're getting a lot of publicity for these topics, as was mentioned by Dear Sue on nutrition. You're getting a lot of publicity and you're getting a lot of conflicting information. In the absence of data, <laughs> That can go on and on and on. So uh, we're going to say that we need a lot more data for these subjects, and data meaning yield data. Because without yield data, you cannot measure what uh, Dear Sue said is most important. Are these economically uh, I'm not going to make judgment on that in this press because there's obviously a, a lack of uh, data right now for these subjects. So my co-authors are Evan Johnson again with thermal therapy. And Stephanie Selinsky is uh, on the staff with Citrus Research and Development Foundation, CRDF, that is a very generous supporter of research that I've done in the past and, and is being done now in the present. Uh, so again, let's go and see what we see. Uh, so the topics are nutritional treatments. I'm quite comfortable in talking about that subject. I'm less comfortable in talking about the subjects of antimicrobials and I'll tell you why, and then thermal therapy uh, with regard to uh, their sustainable uh, use as therapies. So as I follow up on this morning's presentation, I told you about liming history, uh, bicarbonate in water as well as soil, and its impact on tree health, and how that occurs at the root level in terms of water and nutrient uptake. And I told you about this management uh, process of acidifying the water or acidifying the soil. So I won't repeat uh, my comments again, but it's all about sustaining the supply of water and nutrients to roots uh, that have a greater longevity of functioning and extending that uh, longevity of function, the better. So here's the experimental evidence. This is a trial on Trees that we started were about three years old and then through three years, five years old ultimately. And this is measuring the effect of acidification uh, of, a, of a soil uh, in a water that was about pH 7, which is too high for swingle rootstock. We all know that. You know that. We know that. Control treatment with no, uh, no uh, treatment of irrigation water with either uh, acid, acid, sulfuric acid, or sulfur, or the combination of the two. And we acidify to achieve pHs of 6, 5, and 4. And then we look at the irrigation water bicarbonates as a treatment of that water. And we see clearly there's a reduction in the amount of bicarbonates in the water with these acid treatments, as we expect uh, in the beginning to the end of this uh, measurement process over about uh, two years. But more importantly, we're changing, fundamentally changing the pH of the soil. And that takes time. Uh, you can lime soil, but lime and uh, dolomite lime are very slow in their availability of calcium and magnesium as nutritional sources. In our more uh, high pH soils, uh, it, that's not sustainable. In your low pH soils in Brazil, this is quite sustainable because in their acid conditions, magnesium and, and, and calcium are, are liberated or solubilized uh, very, very readily and so you use liming as a nutritional, dolomite liming as a nutritional uh, practice. So here's the story, we're changing the pH. So what does that mean in terms of nutrient uptake? This is the uh, leaf analysis over time, showing you that with the uh, control, that is the, the line with the uh, solid circles, you have a deficit of calcium uptake as reflected by leaf analysis. You also have a deficit of magnesium uptake. When you acidify, you increase the availability of these nutrients, as we predicted. So here's the experimental evidence in support of that. I'm not presenting the evidence from a, uh, a greenhouse study that likewise uh, tested the uh, effect of acidification, or the effect of bicarbonates, rather, on uptake of calcium and magnesium. 
But clearly in this experiment, the, they were uh, uh, reduced by bicarbonates in the greenhouse under a very highly controlled study. And more importantly, something new, a new uh, finding was that water uptake was decreased by bicarbonate under experimental conditions in the greenhouse, measuring uh, water relations in these trees and pots. So here we have a fundamental uh, change in the availability of nutrients as a result of bicarbonate management, which we find across the state of Florida in water and soil. And that's something quite sustainable, but with caveats. There are ways that you can address these calcium and magnesium deficiencies, and you must. These are, this is not an option, and you can't use dolomite in high pH soils, as I said. You can use calcium nitrate. There's been a lot of discussion about calcium nitrate. It's a very, very, but very expensive. Calcium sulfate is much cheaper. In our uh, arena, we can use it as a, a byproduct of the scrubbing of sulfur from uh, power, power plants uh, as a byproduct. So it's, it's quite cheap. It's soluble and it's fast in its response. It's cost effective. Magnesium sulfate, I was told, I learned that magnesium is the most expensive nutrient that you put on citrus trees, at least in our market. But calcium sulfate is, is readily available, it's easy to apply, and the response is fairly rapid. Dolomite, as I said, is slowly available in our higher pH soils, and even in our lower pH soils, uh, takes time. It's slow in its uh, release of calcium and magnesium. So as a source of calcium and magnesium, that's going to give you a, a, a real-time quick response, this is, dolomite is, is lacking. So obviously you need to change the way you uh, fertilize the soil because you're acidifying the environment. And what we found is with acidification, you're actually depleting calcium and magnesium from the soil, as seen in this top graph, over time. This is uh, three years, four years. So you have to, uh, and here are the leaf analysis to reflect that uh, lack of supply. So you have to, you have to supply the, the uh, soil with these soil amendments. You have to change the way you're fertilizing these trees with an HOB. So it's beyond fertigation. It's beyond irrigation. It's also uh, amendment of the soil, supplementation of the soil in a way that's different from the past. OK, so what's the result of this? Uh, do we have enough studies of yield responses? Uh, we have studies of yield responses, mainly from growers' groves and their yield records. But we can see clearly that uh, trees' health is improved. Trees are growing faster and are healthier. And that trees with bicarbonate stress, relieved by acidification, uh, are also healthier and, and growing, and rejuvenating and growing faster again. But this is quite a an impressive response of five-year-old carrizo trees, albeit a more vigorous rootstock compared to nine-year-old swingle trees, that uh, we are sustainably growing citrus uh, in conditions where you manage bicarbonate and with fertigation and acidification. Okay, so I'm going to talk about grower trials that are conducted by CRDF. You have to test these antibiotics that you've heard a lot about. They're called Michael Shield and Fireline if it's oxytetracycline. And firewall is streptomycin. Uh, and they're being evaluated again in these grower trials, which are not replicated plot trials. They are demonstration trials. So keep in mind that this is a treated area and an untreated area to compare. And these uh, are trials that are conducted by growers. So there's a lot of variables, a lot of uncontrolled variables, you would also say, uh, a variety, region, adjuvant, the tank mixing, the, the quality of the water, I said, is important in a lot of ways. The timing of the applications, everything varies from grower to grower here. So there's a lot of uncontrolled variables, keep in mind. That's important to understand the value or, or lack of value of these trials and their conclusions. So the evaluation methods, I don't have time to go into in detail. Uh, Hanato mentioned uh, looking at canopy decline and measuring disease symptom expression. That's something that's quite readily done. and. Uh, reproducible, I think, uh, but the other evaluation methods are, are harder and more labor-intensive. PCR, yield fruit drop, are very intensive uh, things to manage and, and collect, and again are, are things that may lead and explain the uh, variability. So what can we conclude after two years from 42 different sites uh, from grower trials is the following. We've got a lot of variation 
we've got disease severity uh, readings that don't differ too much between treated, that is antibiotic treated, uh, and control untreated areas. PCR results are even more variable, you could say extremely variable, so there's no uh, evidence that you're, re you're reducing or in any way influencing the titer of the tree in the tree of the bacterium. And there's an inconsistent uh, separation between treated and untreated. It, yes, you have, uh, one, you have sites where it's positive, others that are negative, and, and, and no response in between. So overall, you can conclude, I think, very little from these uh, studies so far after two years. And I can imagine the frustration that growers uh, have with trying to decide whether to continue not just trials, but any sort of use of antibiotics uh, in a therapeutic mode. And there's some things we must be uh, concerned about, uh, and that is uh, things that you have some experience with. Uh, not just the lack of efficacy of these uh, and the lack of demonstrated uh, yield response and economic response and the high cost and the need for repeated applications, but something that I find very risky, and that is the risk of residues in fruit and juice, and you've experienced this with carbendazine, so you know what I'm talking about. Furthermore, there's the risk of phytotoxicity of these uh, compounds. Uh, they aren't without some risk. But there's much more concern about, again, antibiotic resistance, that is, effects on target, non-target organisms, bacteria, that develop resistance. And these are issues that are quite uh, largely in the press, and so we must be very concerned about these uh, potential uh, unintended consequences of using antibiotics. So with that, I'll move on to something that may have some promise, but is still in the very beginning stages, and that is this, uh, this uh, bactericide we're calling zincicide because it's based on zinc oxide. And this was developed by Swadesh Santra, a professor at the University of Central Florida that I collaborate with, have collaborated with, in nanotechnology to develop uh, metals for disease control, bacterial control. And this was designed by Dr. Santra to be systemic in its movement based on its size, to mimic that of the size of proteins. It can move from cell to cell. Uh, it has bacterial inhibition because as you reduce the size of a particle, it becomes more exposed to, the bacteria become more exposed to its bactericidal activity. And as I said, it can move from cell to cell, at least theoretically. So, so if you look at that diagram at the top, traditionally you put, uh, anything on, any pesticide on as a film, and it's remaining on the outside and not becoming uh, very systemic, maybe locally systemic, but not highly systemic, whereas with a particle the size of two to four nanometers in diameter, you can have a systemic movement into the tree and even down into the roots, and you can document this movement with various methods, and we have. So here's the principle, is as the particle gets smaller, its uh, surface to volume ratio gets much greater as the particle gets below two nanometers in size, as reflected in that bottom graph. So this is a very uh, potent antimicrobial activity from something we don't expect to have at activity as a larger uh, sized particle, that's zinc oxide. It's not really thought of as a bactericide usually, more of a fungicide. So here's some very preliminary information and I caution that this is uh, just that. It's one trial with one variety in one location, and it was done this past season. Uh, and we look at three different treatments here, a foliar treatment, a soil treatment, that is a drench, and then the combination of the two, and that's the blue, green, and, and orange bars. And then the check treatment, the untreated, is the black bar on the very right. So all treatments and all rates improved yield. This is quite uh, exciting for us, but just the beginning. More importantly, we saw in those three bars represent a dose response. That is, those are three rates from uh, low, medium, high, let's just say, without getting into exactly what the rates are, uh, that we have a rate uh, response in, in, in at least two out of those three treatments. That is, the foliar and the combination of foliar and drench. So that's pretty substantial evidence that we're having an effect on the bacterium in the tree, and that's reflected in some measurements preliminary measurements, I, sh I must emphasize, of a reduction in titer in, the, in these trees and the best treatment, which is the one on the very uh, right next to the check uh, bar, that is the highest bar there, is the uh, 
combination bar at the highest rate of zinc, zinc aside. So just keep in mind that this is in the preliminary stages. Uh, there's a lot of things I could talk about in that, in that formulations development I don't have time for. But let's move on to thermotherapy. And uh, I want to emphasize here that thermotherapy has a lot of uh, effects on the physiology and behavior of trees that uh, we didn't quite understand very well at the beginning. But the treatment must be uh, op optimized because you're killing uh, the host tissue at the same time you're trying to uh, kill or reduce the bacterial titer in the tree. So time and temperature, the um, amount of duration of a temperature that's uh, potentially lethal, and that's somewhere around 55 to 60 degrees centigrade, is very important. You, you must adjust that and, and study that in depth with many treatments. And what these uh, unintended consequences are, or maybe intended in some cases, but it, they don't seem very positive, is that when you kill tissue above the ground and, and, and essentially, stimulate, you st essentially stimulate bacterial movement upward, as, as Silvio showed you, so you have to really integrate these treatments ultimately, uh, according to Evan Johnson, with something to kill these mobilized bacteria because they're going up and they're causing more infection above the ground when you kill the tissue and the bacteria moves up in response to that. So very quickly, in the interest of time, we have different, uh, different durations of temperature. We have un un untreated on the very left. And then we have 55 degrees for zero minutes, which means like a heat shock effect. Then we have 55 uh, degrees centigrade and 60 seconds, 90 seconds, 120 seconds. And then we have 60 degrees centigrade, which causes more uh, damage to the tree for 30 seconds. And these are just uh, some, some of the comparisons of different uh, temperature uh, time regimes. And what you see there is the change in titer below ground and above ground. You can see it varies quite a bit. And there is, in fact, a a, st a stimulation of bacterial movement above the ground without getting into very detailed uh, interpretation of that. You are having bacterial movement upwards into the tree, into the canopy. And if you're thinking about psyllid uh, transmission or the acquisition and transmission process, this is not a, not a positive thing in terms of the epidemiology. And here's something, uh, physiologically speaking, that's uh, very important to understand and, and trying to overcome this becomes even more difficult in my mind, and that is there's a seasonal effect. And this is the, this is the change in uh, below ground response between the spring and summer, and they're completely different. The below ground response over time, this is over a two year period, those different small bars within each cluster, of the different uh, temperature uh, time regimes shows you that with a spring treatment you get some uh, stimulation of, of root growth, root production with thermotherapy treatment, whereas in the summer you get some very negative effects that last, that are long lasting. That is, there's a detrimental effect on tree health that's very holistic, very over, over, over all the treatment, uh, over all the tree's health above and below ground you have a, 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 la a loss of roots, a loss of root health. So uh, I think I can say that canopy and root infection are interacting in these treatments and the responses to them. There's a need to test treatments for not just below ground and above ground effects, but both in a holistic way. And you need to show ultimately that there's yield, reproducible yield improvement and there has been no ultimate uh, measurements of that yet in any of these thermotherapy studies uh, so far because it takes so long for these treatments to stabilize in their behavior and then the trees to be measured in succeeding uh, seasons, baseline, and then responses to, to treatment. So this is requiring many years to test. The root and canopy responses are, are very difficult to predict and must be considered together. You can't just uh, look at one above ground or below ground in the absence of the other. So with that, I will end by saying uh, that these therapies uh, have a long way to go in terms of their validation. Thank you.